As part of our Arts and Culture series, tonight's event is sponsored by Four Culture, Arts Fund, Washington State Arts Commission, and the Seattle Office of Arts and Culture. The Bushwick Book Club Seattle is also supported by Four Culture and the Seattle Office of Arts and Culture. Thanks to all of our sponsors for making tonight's event possible. And finally, Town Hall and Bushwick are both member-supported organizations, so I'd like to thank all of the members joining us. Tonight, the Bushwick Book Club Seattle performs an evening of mu music inspired by Matt Haig's The Midnight Library. Here to get it started is the Associate Director of Bushwick and our MC for the evening, Wes Waddell. Inspiration from the page Now translated for the stage It don't matter what your age is All the rage is Right here at the Bushwick Book Club We haven't had a lot of sunny days and you came indoors on one of them. We appreciate that. We appreciate all of you watching at home. My name is Wes Waddell. I am the Associate Director of Bushwick Northwest, the 501c3 nonprofit organization. I am a tall, lanky white guy who experimented with facial hair during the pandemic. I'm just north of 40. I am wearing a shirt that belonged to my father. Um, that song's still going. It's real hot in the monitors, but I like it. Thank you. Um, we did it. It is, it is such a fascinating time in the arts, and tonight we close our 12th main stage season. Um, after our 11th was entirely remote, uh, and we did it. Uh, we persisted. We paid people every step of the way. Um, we're very proud of that, and we're very proud to have you here and celebrate original music inspired by Matt Haig's The Midnight Library. Who read it? All right, who's ever been to a library? Who's ever stayed up till midnight? Yeah, we might get you there tonight. Oh, it's gonna be good. Um, in, closing the, in closing the season, um, we're gonna celebrate, uh, since we started in September here at Town Hall Seattle, s over 60 different acts have come up on this stage throughout the season, writing an original song inspired by literature. There have been over 80 new songs created by local artists now inspired by literature from this season. Um, tonight we are also partnering with Seattle Rep, another wonderful arts organization. Uh, and so interspersed throughout the songs and spoken word pieces you'll hear tonight, there are going to be four excerpts from Keiko Green, local playwright Keiko Green's The Ballad of the White Tiger, which uh, connects thematically to the Midnight Library. We just thought it'd be a little fun thing to do to celebrate saying goodbye to the season. We will also, toward the end of the night, do a little teaser announcement of some of our books chosen for next year, 2022, 23. That's right. Um, all the rep uh, sections tonight were directed by Elliot Hartman. Big hand for Elliot. This evening, you will hear original words and music from Bridget Quigg, Nick Draws, Kevin Hyde, Rob Arnold, Nottingham Wicks with Nick Allison, Peter Donovan, Jed Crisoligo, Kate Barrett, Matt Price, Intasar, and Kate Olson. Hand for all of them, please. The evening will unfold in two halves, uh, two acts with an intermission. After intermission, there will be a quiz. You can sign up for the quiz. We'll send Melissa, our membership director, around with slips a little later in the act, but let's get the music going. Coming up to the stage right now, yeah, right now, <laughs> is Bridget Quigg. Bridget Quigg <laughs> is a fan favorite who probably doesn't need this introduction. But I can tell you, is a former startup kid who now teaches creativity and intuition classes full time. She has been performing comedy and music in Seattle for nearly 20 years and would like you to come to her intuition retreat on July 9th. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Bridget likes riding her bike all over Seattle and has found that people on the sidewalks will cheer for her on steep hills. It feels nice. They do. They she has excited. joined Bushwick for original music inspired by Pride and Prejudice. Batman, The Dark Knight Returns, Horton Hears a Who, The Shining, Works of Shakespeare, and many, many more. Please give a big Bushwick welcome to Bridget Quigg. Thank you, Wes. Thank you, everyone. 
Thank you for coming out. This is so exciting. I am back on stage for the first time in 28 months. Yay! <laughs> Dreams can come true. It can happen to you. You can get back on stage. We're just going to twist this one more time and let it be inside out. Now it's happy. All right. Um, welcome. So good to see everybody in the little way that I can. Um, I read the book. It was a really good book. Uh, if you've read it, did you, anybody love it? Yeah. Can I, yeah, okay. It's a really good book. I posted a little social media about the show tonight, and most of the people weren't like, good luck. They're like, oh, I read that book. I loved it. I was like, I wish I could be there. Um, oh, and I'm supposed to introduce myself for the audio folks that I'm about six feet tall with really large curly hair. Okay, that's the visual <laughs> I'm giving you. Um, so this book was interesting because it starts out really sad and really edgy, and a lot of things in the world right now are kind of sad and edgy, and you're kind of like, ooh, here we go. Um, and this you know, poor young woman has the worst day you could ever imagine, truly, and um, decides to take her life. This is the beginning of the book. I get to spoil it because I get to. And she attempts to. And she goes to this place, the Midnight Library, and gets to go through the regrets she had in life and live them out and see what would have been like to be to have stuck with swimming and gone to the Olympics and broken records, only to find that when she looks at her forearm, she has the marks from the cutting she did in that lifetime. So it's a really interesting book, because it's like every time you think she's going for the one that's going to be the good life, they're all complicated, they're all messy, and it's just life. So it's a beautiful thing, because I thought it would be so edgy that it wouldn't resolve back to what I felt like was kind of the cheesy ending, which is kind of before enlightenment, chop wood, carry water, after enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. It kind of had that energy of like, it's all perspective, baby, just live the life you got, which I totally enjoyed. And for um, Wes's benefit, you all just met Wes, he's really good at saying to me things like, oh, you just took like bridge over troubled waters and put it in a blender, and that's how you wrote your song. Like he loves to sit and watch what we do, and be like every song has been written. And I have to confess, I got really obsessed with Neil Diamond's Solitary Man about two months before the show. And listened to it, you know, these things happen, they're inexplicable. I was raised with Neil, I love Neil. And so I write the song, which you're gonna hear, and I realize as I'm doing it, because it starts with this, it starts with that little E minor walk down. And I was like, wait a second, <laughs> that's Solitary Man. Although I've moved it up. And basically every chord in Solitary Man I figured out in two seconds because they're all in my song. <laughs> it's like, Melinda was mine till the time. You get the idea. So there you go. That one, that was for Wes, who always figures out where my songs came from. It's okay. It's called Inspiration. It's okay. All right. So my song is sort of a ode to the fact that um, you kind of get up, dust yourself off, and you try again a little bit. And that we all have a pretty good sense of ourselves more than we give ourselves credit for, which is something this woman discovers in the book. In the darkness, in the night, in the darkness, in the night, one path gives off the dimmest light. I am seeking, I am seeking, sorting. Looking for a sign to show me a signal I will quickly know what I'm feeling, I am feeling It's alright to trust There's something deep inside of us When it pings and pulls We feel a sense to follow And it's not wrong to sense Yo. 
it going for Bridget Diamond. <laughs> oh, Bridget Quigg has uh, her all-day intuition retreat at Madison Park on July 9th. You can find out more at BridgetQuigg.com. And if you can't spell that, go to, oh, well, it's right there. <laughs> but uh, go to uh, our, our virtual, our digital program for tonight at bit.ly slash ml hyphen PGM. I'm waiting for that slide to prove me right. There it is. Or, uh, you know, no one's had a better two years than the QR code, man. <laughs> that thing was left for dead, and now you can't get french fries without a phone and dealing with that. But we have links to all of the artists and actors tonight at that. If you want to, to check out some of their music, remember... Remember your evening, you can, uh, that will live forever, because that's how the internet works. Um, and Bridget, I'm sorry I've gotten in the habit of telling you what your songs sound like, but I only do that because uh, Bushwick Northwest Executive Dire uh, Director Jeff Larson does that to me every time I <laughs> perform at a Bushwick show, uh, he comes up. I mean, when you're under the gun, you know, you're kind of, you just, you're going with your idea, and you don't realize that you just rewrote somebody else's song until you did it. <laughs> and so... Uh, coming up to the stage now is uh, the owner of this fine machine back here. A songwriter with a catalog of work that spans more than 20 years and an engaging, polished performer. <laughs> Don't make me look bad, buddy. Nick Draws sews stories of humanity to ear-catching melodies that may or may not have existed before. He spent a decade in Austin, Texas, honing his craft before moving to Seattle in early 2015. You can catch him around Seattle performing solo with his new band, Mono a Mono, and as a sideman in numerous local projects. He made his Bushwick debut in this very space, right, for Animal Vegetable Miracle. He's also done Persepolis, Delta of Venus. That was a steamy one. Become America, The Phantom Tollbooth, Station Eleven, both our Seattle Arts and Lectures and Jack Straw Partnerships, and more, Nick Draws. This is the first Bushwick I've done back in person since you could do that, and that's the best thing ever. Um, also, uh, I'm realizing hearing that bio read out loud that I should maybe set the bar a little lower for myself. <laughs> I don't want to follow me. Um, I read the book. I didn't love the book. I'm like the only person I know, uh, my, uh, with the exception of my partner, I didn't, I didn't love the book. Um, there were like some sort of like shallow, eh, still entertaining kind of things that I didn't like about it. Um, one of those was that uh, as she, as the main character gets to try out all these new lives, she just wakes up into a life and she has to engage with all these people that she's never met before. And like, for instance, one time she's like, a, you know, she's studying the Arctic in the wild and another time she's an Olympic swimmer and another time she's in a band and doesn't know half the songs. And the author always makes it a point to like, say like, she stared at him and you know nodded, but she had no idea what he was saying. After a while, I was like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, we get it. We can skip that part. Maybe in the next like five to six lives that she lives, she's gonna live." Um, but the I, I found myself like like kind of upset actually after the book. So let me state uh, for the record that one, I don't want to like constrain what people can write in fiction. Like 
do your thing, get after it, get imaginative, great. Two, I think the book ended with a really like positive message. I totally see where he was going with it, and and I think like perspective is wonderful. Like get the help you need. Like you know it's it's all good, but. The thing that really bugged me about it while I was reading it is it sort of felt like, so she takes a swing at ending her own life and uh, she gets to, as a result, she's not successful, but while she's sort of in this limbo, she gets to try out all these different lives like Bridget mentioned and see what like life would have been like if she could rewrite some of those regrets she had and you know, she ends up at the end being like, no, the life I want is the you know my root life, the life I had. And then suddenly she just like doesn't, you know, it's just everything is wrapped up and it's solved. And I kind of felt like, it almost felt to me like, it's like, well, if you're having these kind of ideations, you know, a tool you have is to, to take a swing and a miss, to try and fail, and then you'll totally see life's worth living. And that just felt, I didn't like the way that felt. And I know it wasn't his intention. So, I'm, you know, I'm wanna, I've, I've mellowed some since finishing the book. So, um, so uh, I, know, uh, I, I know Matt, uh, Haig was, you know, he, I know the place he's coming from. I read a bunch of interviews with him and read about him and like, I think, like, great. Um, so one thing I did notice, uh, and this is what my song is about, um, there's all this focus uh, on, on the main character, Nora, and like all these lives she gets to try leading. And there's people around her, um, and she interacts with a lot of them, or some of them. Um, and there's just really no focus or attention to like w what that means for any of them for the most part. And so when she does try to end her own life and she wakes up, she finds her neighbor because she needs to tell somebody she needs to get to a hospital, like she needs help. And so I wrote a song uh, from his perspective. His name in the book is Mr. Banjury. Um, and uh, I changed her name uh, from Nora to Leon for reasons I'm not even going to begin to get into right now. But also, it sings pretty nice, so we're just gonna <laughs> we're gonna go with that. Uh, the song is called "Good Lord Leon," um, and I hope that you like it. Come to your stomach and let you 
flowers Couple days afterwards I'm glad you made it Thanks. Also, I realized I forgot to say, I'm a six foot one white guy with uh, long hair on top and a shaved head underneath. <laughs> Cause I thought that was cool and it turns out everyone has this haircut. <laughs> so uh, Nick, t tell me about uh, any regrets you have going on right now. I'm good with okay, all right, just check it. <laughs> Would you like the chance to do that over? Yeah. I think I'm rocking. Okay, all right. All right good. All I right. agree. Very you're, good. you're rocking it. Uh, Nick Draws, everyone. <laughs> Nick has a duo show July 7th at the Fiddler's Inn. I think I'm the other half of that duo. Um, July 14th, Mono and Mono at the Blue Moon Tavern. August 24th, Mono and Mono at Connor Byrne. If you want some Nick Draws merch. He's got a bunch of it over there, as do a lot of our performers tonight. And now I'm really happy to have up on stage. I can't take all the light. Get into that. So thank you. This is Nabra Nelson. Nabra is the Director of Arts Engagement for Seattle Rep, which alone deserves a hand. <laughs> in, uh, in Nabra's short tenure in town, she has just connected with so many organizations. You bring such a, a really special and giving approach to scene, and I'm delighted to partner with Seattle Rep uh, to tell you a little bit about what's gonna happen next. This is Navra Nelson. Thank you so much. We absolutely love uh, partnering with Bushwick. I'm just a big fan. Uh, this is our third collaboration. Started with Shakespeare, and then we said, well, we're not gonna wait till there's another Shakespeare. So uh, we did Like a Mother, and now we're excited to do uh, Midnight Library, which will be a little bit different if y'all have been following our collabs. Um, so today, we're really um, highlighting our new play program. Um, as a physical description, I am a late, uh, tall, light-skinned brown woman with short, very short brown hair and a very bright green neon dress. Uh, so Seattle Rep is really committed to uh, supporting new work through our commissioning program and our new play development lab called The Other Season. And we also, of course, produce new plays like the one that's on our stage right now, Bruce, which is also based on a book, The Jaws Log by Carl Gottlieb, who also wrote Jaws. So that's a little sneak peek into what it's about. So go check it out. Um, in the other season, we offer artists support tailored to their artistic process through year-round readings, residencies, and workshops. And 20 by 30, a reimagining the Anthropocene, is our ambitious new commissioning initiative, which engages 20 playwrights between now and 2030 to each write a play inspired by life in our moment in the Anthropocene. Through cultivating these essential relationships, our goal is really to make Seattle a destination place for new plays and give our audiences first access to exciting new theater. So today you'll be hearing uh, some excerpts from Keiko Green's play, Ballad of the White Tiger. And Keiko Green is a playwright we've been engaging with for a while and who is a local playwright. Um, she is an award-winning playwright, screenwriter, and performer, and is a core company member of ACT Theater here in Seattle, and previously a resident playwright both at Theater Muse New Play Incubator, at, at New K Play Incubator called the Mu Tang Clan, that's a cool <laughs> name, as well as Seattle Refs Writers Group. Her plays range from coming-of-age comedies to large concept horror and everything in between, exploring the un expected connection between people from different backgrounds, as well as the internal tensions within our bodies. And I'll give you a quick synopsis of The Ballad of the White Tiger. You'll have to keep this in mind as you hear the excerpts because they are um, somewhat in order, uh, but they are random excerpts from the play, so try to piece it together. 
Uh, after a horrific accident, two biracial sisters are left estranged. Hannah disappears to Japan in an effort to connect with her Japanese heritage and start over. Yuki, now in a wheelchair, picks up the pieces and moves on in her new life. In Japan, Hannah slowly learns of the complicated history of the Aizu people and the story of the White Tiger, a clan of young samurai boys who met a tragic demise in a feudal war in the 1800s, a war that left a mark on this territory of Japan as eternal outsiders, in quotations. As these old stories come to life, Yuki and Hana's paths seem to head into the same tragic ends as their ancestors. In this story of familial connection, multiracial identity, and the impossible desire to take back one terrible action that will haunt you forever. Sound familiar? So, uh, as uh, Wes said, Elliot Hartman directed and cast these uh, excerpts. Anneli Hamilton will be playing Yuki. Drew Highland will be playing David, who is Hannah's boyfriend who she left back in the US when she went to Japan. And now uh, Reese Daly will be playing a scene, uh, will be performing a scene as the character Hannah. Thank you so much. been thinking about you, uh, so I, I thought I'd write to say hey. So hey. <laughs> um, I don't know what to say to you. Uh, of course, I, I want to say sorry, but I've spent so much of our lives apologizing for myself, so <laughs> I don't know if it means anything to you anymore. I'm writing to tell you that I'm okay. I'm in Japan now. I needed to find some answers for myself, and I thought maybe I could find them here, but I think I pissed people off here even more than I did in the US, if that's possible. <laughs> and to be honest, it's, it's not really doing a whole lot for me either. Uh, you're, you're not missing out on anything. Oh, even that old story that Bachan used to tell us about our town? The, the brave and noble white tiger boys who lost their lives in the Boshin War. <laughs> so, during that war, Aizu, fucking losers that we are, they lose and lose and lose and lose until there's only one unit left. Yeah, it's like this mighty duck-style ragtag group of literal children. <laughs> that, that's what the white tigers was. 20 boys separated from the rest of their unit scrambling up by Muri Hill to try and hide. And they look out and they see their castle is on fire. Their castle is burning. They lost the end. So, so they fall on their swords one by one, just like Bachan said. They die on that hill that overlooks their town, knowing it's hopeless. It's all hopeless. And Aizu is declared a traitor town. Did you know that? And the city's never quite the same again. It's never quite accepted again. And the town just kind of gets old. And the boys' bodies rot on the top of that hill. But, turns out, funny story, <laughs> uh, the castle was never actually on fire. The area around the castle was burning, and the smoke clouded their view, and the boys just kind of saw their worst fears realized and killed themselves. So, that's where we're from. A bunch of trigger-happy little idiot boys. <laughs> and people, like, celebrate them here. They honor them for it. There's a, a tiny museum with replicas and Memorials that school field trips go on. I, <laughs> I don't get it. <sighs> oh, oh, one, one voice survived. Yeah. His name was Makoto. I knew Makoto. They found him on the hill, 
bloody, just spitting up blood between his two dead brothers. He left their bodies behind and told the story. That's how they even know it happened. Because some shitbag kid couldn't even kill himself, right? There's nothing here, Yuke. Sad stories and old buildings. That's it. Um, there's a winding path down Aimori Hill with a shrine there that's built kind of like a fun house, which is kind of cool. And a, a long, heavy pole sticking out of the earth. I didn't understand the significance of this pole. Uh, it has a slot in it to put money in. Something for the shrine, for them to make money off of tourists, you know? <laughs> um, one day, a tour guide told me about it. He'd seen me around enough, and he probably wanted me to stop hanging around. He said that there is a deep pain of lost souls that fills the area, and that you can alleviate some of it by turning this pole, so I did. And Yuki, I turned that pole, and the most horrible ear-splitting screech screamed out. It was so awful, and it reminded me of, um, Anyway, I couldn't take it. So I ran and I ran and I ran all the way down the hill through the streets until I didn't know where I was anymore, even though I barely knew where I was anyway. That's how bad it was. Who's going to turn that pole? Not me. Also, it's landlocked, so all the fish is brought in and it's fucking pickled, if you can believe that. <laughs> so. What I'm trying to say is, you'd hate it, honest. Anyway, Hannah. Reese Daly. All right, coming up to the stage now is one of our first timers. We have several tonight. Ooh, this is Kevin. <laughs> Somebody knows him. This is him. Uh, Kevin Hyde yeah. is handy with rock and roll music outfits. His competency around several instruments and recording rigs come in handy while writing and rehearsing with various outfits like Seattle's Shadow Pattern and Chicago's The Holy Alimonies. Yeah. Welcome, Kevin Hyde. Hey. Hi. <clears throat> I'm uh, an optimistic six foot tall white guy <clears throat> with beard, a little salt and pepper kind of coming in. Got kind of an old jacket and black jeans, uh, like 90s uh, dandruff shampoo commercial hair. <clears throat> so I got that going for me. Um, Long time, Bushwick, Bushwick, long time audience member, first time player. Thanks for having me. Um, <clears throat> it's really great to participate in this. Like I've, you know, a lot of my friends are musicians who have, who have played Bushwick and, and kind of talked about the experience. So, you know, having the opportunity to, you know, step on this side of the stage is, is really exhilarating. And more than anything, I just appreciate the challenge, right? Like I'm a very, like, I like songwriting, I'm just very slow at it. Very, it just takes a long time. It's not, it's not like my primary thing. Like, I like playing instruments with other people's bands. Uh, so having, having a prompt and a deadline is a, an extremely helpful exercise to just, like, do something, right? To just, like, make art. Um, and then also, like, performing solo. Like, that's not, that's not my bag, but <laughs> I'll, give it a, I'll give it a shot. Uh, Midnight Library, the book. Um, you know, it was, it was okay. It was okay. It wasn't. It wasn't my favorite book. <laughs> uh, it wasn't my favorite book. But you know, it wasn't. It wasn't necessarily like w what I took away from it is that it was a really like interesting, cool, engaging device to kind of deliver the moral of the story, which is kind of ambiguous. I don't really know. Like I took away from it was like, all right, like keep on trucking, like you know, <laughs> for sure. Uh, but I like. <clears throat> I like like quantum whatever and science and and the multiverse like that was just like an interesting way to kind of like paint this picture 
and uh, and create this like vignette of like if you had all these chances to live again, you know, would anything actually really change? Um, so 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 you know like as from like a songwriting standpoint, I was just like, okay, I've never done this before. Like, what do I do? Right, so I'm reading the book and I'm like, oh, okay, that's an interesting use of words. I'm gonna dog you that page. And I just went through the whole book, like making all these little notes and be like, well, maybe I'll go back, maybe I'll find something I can sink my teeth into and just like go in a direction. And I did this good because like I read the book like as soon as I knew that I was playing Bushwick so I could just get that done and then write a song for like two months. Which I, turns out I needed because it then this was a very circuitous process to come back and like tried out all these things. I went through the book, like tried to grab phrases and words, tried to like think of like oh this is just like a theme that I can latch onto that I can really vibe on. And I ping ponged my way to something where there was like a groove that I could follow. I was like okay cool, like you know what if that's all I get from it, then I'll just do wherever that song takes me. And the song took me right back to some places. It's like right on the nose of what this song is about. So like, as far as I tried to like get away uh, from what was going on in the book, it, it kind of turned out relatively relevant. But, <clears throat> just, like I didn't, I thought that ship had sailed. Um, so, but like in hindsight, looking back on it, I think ultimately I think what actually is happening in this song that like came out of this is uh, really leaning into this character of the librarian, because she's kind of cavalier, right? She's kind of like, you know, you make your own decisions, right? Like, you know, like, it's your choice. Um, so she's a little hands off, right? Uh, and like, just trying to spirit guide this person through this process. So there's a little bit of that voice in there, although it's a little different. Um, and da 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 da. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, so I'm going to play it now. Did, did, was there anything else I was supposed to do? No. All right. I didn't. I didn't title it either. So. Check out now who's gonna sing all your greatest hits. Well, the sad facts are cancer bullet a car. Every day is just a roll of the dice. And all the water coulda shooters in the world will never suffice. So you go looking for an easier life, going to take another book from the shelf. And you can change your whole scene, but you can't get away from yourself. Well, the 
poke a regret is a laborious tome and reading it will make you feel scarred. But all you really get are wrinkles in your library card. Ah, and all the chapters that you didn't check out, they're fading into ashes and dust. If you could buy life now, you eat it all and finish the crust. And if you hope for an easy way out, go and jump out of the nearest window. All you get is Schrodinger's cat dancing on the keys of a piano. All you get is Schrodinger's cat dancing on the keys of a piano. All you get is Schrodinger's cat dancing on the keys of a piano. Kevin Hyde. Nice work. Welcome to the club. You earned the last swig of that Costco brand LaCroix. That a buddy. Yeah. Hey, I mentioned earlier, this is Jeff Larson, by the way, executive director of Bushwick Northwest. I mentioned earlier that after intermission there will be a quiz. And uh, coming around now to hand out slips. If you care to enter, it is by choice. The barrier to entry is low is our membership director, Melissa Montalto. And if you want to ask someone what it's like to be a quiz contestant, you can ask Kevin Hyde. He what? was pulled up on stage earlier this year, and if I remember right, he didn't win. <laughs> but he looked like he had a good time. Yeah, well, I, yeah, that time. <laughs> uh, oh, you can't, well, you can't, you can't put it up now. Okay, all right. <laughs> Uh, we've got another first-timer coming up. Make some first-time noise. We're really, really happy to have Rob Arnold up. Rob is the executive director of Hugo House, which is uh, a great literary organization here in town, a longtime supporter and collaborator with Bushwick. We have hosted shows there for several years. Somebody that has been a friend to us for a long time, but Rob is also an accomplished poet and writer himself, and uh, I really wanted to, to try to involve him on the creative side of things, and we're happy to do it this season. Everybody, please give a warm first time welcome to Rob Arnold. Oh, nice. It's tall for me. How wonderful. Hi, everyone. Half a day. Um, thank you so much for having me here. Um, I have to say, it's a little intimidating to be up here um, following so many amusing musicians with just my voice. Um, I'm going to be reading a poem. Uh, and thanks so much to Wes and Jeff for having me, um, the rest of the Bushwick Book Club crew. Uh, I'm a tallish, broadish, ambiguously ethnic, indigenous dude wearing mostly black and a hat, um, which is my signature look. So um, I'm going to read just one very uh, uh, non-literal poem. Um, it was really inspired by thematic elements of the book and also structural elements of the book. And I wanted to bring those two things together into this poem. Um, and thematically, um, of course, we've been talking so much about the theme of regrets. Um, and so that was, of course, something that struck me because a lot of my work is sort of infused with regrets. Um, I write a lot about family, and I'll be reading about family tonight. Um, and the other theme that I was really, um, kind of more structural element that I was inspired by was multiplicity. Um, you know, the, the various lives that uh, the main character uh, is able to live. Um, 
So yeah, so I took a personal approach. I wrote a poem um, sort of about my brother who passed away a year ago. Um, we yes. had a complex relationship, a relationship that I would have loved to have changed at various points in our life, um, the way that this character was able to do. And, um, and also um, the multiplicity angle. Um, I found that multiple structure really um, compelling. And I tried to do that in this poem by um, introducing uh, polyvocality into it. So that you'll hear a second voice come on as I read this poem. Um, and so hopefully there'll be um, elements of the poem that overlap and moments where they intersect and then split apart again, very similar to the way the novel works. Um, okay, so that's it. And the poem is called Once. And all right, hope this works. Okay, once we're brothers, was a night, an open window, was infirmary infinity, was a mouth agape, was a twitch of eye, a finger, was the arm bruised where the tattoos discolored, was the eyelid flutter, where the crabbed hands was the clutching and the sucking air. Once, Once or brothers, brothers was, was a the night, tube, an open window, the chemical binge, was infirmary, was the infinity, bulge, the was a mouth of agape, veins, and was a nightfall, twitch of eye, of finger, the endless same, was the arm and yellowing eye, bruised, with the was the vacant stare, discolored, the photograph saved the on the flutter, daughter's phone, with the crab, was the recognition, hands, was the, the return, and sucking air. Once. Once was a brothers, snowfall, was the, the secrets denial, the chemical binge, was the forgetting, was the bulge, were choices, the display of veins, was the weight, nightfall, sand in the, the eye, the clouded and, and reckless eye, night, was the, the blackness of the storm drain, the photograph broken crawdads, phone, the bloated cat, was the recognition, and severed the snake. Once were was guns, the snowfall, was the smoke, the, secrets, the smell, denial, the shattered window, the shared room, choices, the body pen, the once the trigger, the eye, the once the snapped bone, night, the face the smashed the through the windshield, drain, the crawl space where only we could hear our beaten hearts. Once, once we're, we're brothers, brothers still living, living we're separations, where the, the years, years flown, flown, the drunk phone call was, was the rotted, rotted foot, rotted insides, were the false teeth left by, by the, the deathbed. Bed. Once, once were, were the words, words and, and once, once was your mind. Was your mind. Thank you. Rob Arnold. Thank you, Rob. Welcome to the club. All right, from a first timer to someone sharing their 18th song for Bushwick. Woo! Woohoo! Carrie Wicks, three time Earshot Jazz Vocalist of the Year nominee, exhibits a rare combination of relaxed listenability and deep musicality. I agree. Her four CDs on Origin Records have received national acclaim and airplay. Pianist Nick Allison, a first-timer. So they average nine songs. Uh, part of the Northwest music scene for 40 years is renowned for his sensitive accompaniment, versatility, and understated passion, not to mention the three-hour gig he already played today. These two longtime collaborators have been playing and writing music together since early 2012. Carrie Wicks, Nick Allison. Good, e good evening, everyone. I hope you're all having a good evening. I already asked that, said that. Um, you might be wondering where the Nottingham portion of Nottingham Wicks is. Well, Ken couldn't make it tonight, but I couldn't have co-written this song without him. And so I'd like to honor his huge part in the creative process in celebration of this being our, it's true, the 18th song that we have written, co-written for Bushwick Book Club Seattle. 
Um, the song is called Wild Tonic, and I am short with glasses and salt and pepper long hair wearing a navy power suit. <laughs> and Nick, um, I, oh, so I'm going to tell you about him later. Um, I am also grateful to have Nick Allison on the piano this evening, another longtime collaborator who helped shape this song into being. And Nick has got white short hair, short white hair, with glasses and a blue and gray plaid sport coat. <laughs> I learned it's not called a suit. I, I guess it's just a suit if you're a woman and it's a sport coat if you're a man. Depends on the traffic, man. Oh, okay, say, I didn't know that about the, okay. <laughs> um, and so after sharing my notes about the, um, um, after sharing my notes about the song with Nick, he wrote, and I quote, the song is honestly pretty obscure, cryptic, a bit hard to decipher. But as I looked over your stuff and the book, two aspects of the inspiration became clearer. Thoreau's notion of the tonic of wildness where alone in nature you feel a connection that eradicates loneliness, and the idea that being absorbed or immersed in making art, or in swimming, or in any, anything else, you can kind of forget about yourself and your troubles. So, um, now back to me. Uh, much gratitude to the Bushwick Book Club for having us, and we are wishing Elisa well, and we appreciate the opportunity to be creative, to swim among the nature of books, disappearing into pure focus. Okay, I think I'm ready. Are you done, buddy? Right. Then we'll do Amy's crossword later. Did everyone get Amy's crossword? It's around, you need that there, yeah. I'm gonna bring this home and do this later. Okay, the song, Wild Tonic. Oh, I'm bad with you. 
Nick Allison on the piano. Thank you. Carrie Wicks. Nick Allison. I'm collaborating in absentia, Ken Nottingham. Nick and Carrie have a three hour gig at Northwest Cellars in Kirkland on July 15th, and then another one after they've recovered on September 15th. Um, and uh, the crossword puzzle that Carrie mentioned, Amy Zoe created a, a, uh, a book-themed crossword for every show we did this season, uh, including tonight's, a Midnight Library-themed crossword puzzle, if that's your thing. Snap that QR, look at that. Just waiting to be, uh, to be camera'd. Um, and all season long, we said if you send us a PDF or a photo of a completed crossword, you can be entered in a drawing for new tickets. And I bet we could roll that over to next season, too, because I'm going to tell you what the first book of it is later. <laughs> Let's check back in on The Ballad of the White Tiger with uh, Anna Lee Hamilton and Drew Highlands. Take them with you. The flowers. Hannah will like them. Her namesake. What? Kenji didn't tell you? Tell me what? Jesus. What is it? Tell me. Hannah's gone. Gone? Where? I don't know. She left. She left me. I, I haven't seen her. I mean, no one's seen her. I thought maybe that well, you... What about, what about the restaurant? Not there. I mean, she didn't tell them anything. She just didn't show up for a Friday dinner service Oh and... my god. Yeah. I mean, she's gone. I, she... I don't know. How long? The whole time. Uh, Six weeks. Left the postcard on the table. Those old vengeance ones from her collection, you know? Right. And? You're a good person. I'm sorry. That's all? Yeah. Jesus! On the other side, there's this ad for bleach or something. I don't know, this sexy little housewife telling me about using bleach to take out stains. <laughs> Jesus, Hannah. So what does it mean? Where is she? What about the everything? I, I, I don't know. What about the cats, her plants, her shit? I, I don't understand. Is she coming home? Am I supposed to wait for her? Or is she gone? Or, I mean, I can't afford rent on my own. And I definitely didn't want cats. I don't even like cats. <laughs> Yuki, is she talking about fucking suicide or something? I mean, because if she shows up like dead in a river or something, no, I don't think I could. No, no, David. It's classic, Hannah. <laughs> she could have just said, I'm leaving you, or I'm killing myself, if that was what was happening, or I'm going to the gym, whatever. But no, she leaves you hanging, and she's one of those people that causes drama because she's not actually interesting without it. All right, we got one more song before intermission, and then a whole bunch more songs after. Woo! Yes! All right, are you feeling, I don't know, what are you feeling? Shout it out. Pretty good. Okay. <laughs> All right, good. I mean, there's a lot of things you could be feeling. One is like, I can't really follow that with like, are you feeling good? But, you know, we're here to, we're here to feel. We're here to be present. We're here to witness one another. Let's bring up Peter Donovan. Yeah. All right. Recently released a debut solo record called... This better be good. <laughs> Available everywhere, including links we have in our digital program. He's joined us for Frog and Toad, Seattle Walk Report, Exhalation, All the Light We Cannot See. Three of the four of those were remote. So it's really great to have you on the stage. Peter Donovan. neighborhood walks in Seattle with like lots of fun illustrations and it's very whimsical it's like almost impossible to write a sad song inspired by it um, but a couple weeks before the show one of my dogs had passed away so 
I was like, you know what, I'm feeling some feelings, I'm just gonna write a sad song. Um, so, you know, I show up and everyone's singing these very like fun songs about walking and I had a sad song about death, but I played it with the caveat that if I was invited back, I would not write a song about death. So, as it turns out, as I started reading this book, I was like, might have, might have lied to the Bushwick Book Club uh, last time I was there. But I think once you get into the book, you kind of realize it's more about life than it is about death. So um, this one's not about death, luckily, for you guys. Um, but one of the things that really stuck out to me in the book was, as she's kind of in her alternate um, realities, you know, she'll run into people that she knows from other lives, but that she doesn't know in the current life. And she kind of gets a sense of, like, what her like the lack of her in their lives, like how that affected them. Very like, uh, it's a wonderful life kind of thing. Um, so I thought that was interesting. I think like you really can't really know, like as we kind of go about our daily lives, like we interact with people all the time. And you know, sometimes it could be like just being nice to a stranger could be pretty powerful. So it got me feeling kind of grateful about the people in my life that make me feel good when I'm not feeling good. So this is a song about those folks. It's called uh, You Always Do. And having one of those days when nothing seems to go my way, I got nothing to celebrate, so I drink wine and I belly ache. You tell me enough is enough You buy around to some stronger stuff You try to cheer me up And you do Yeah, you always do Well, I've been worried about my life I don't think I've been doing it right Regrets are piling high What if start to multiply? You say don't worry about the past The future's coming and it doesn't last You make a joke trying to make me laugh And you do Yeah, you always do I could have been something better than Whatever it is I am You say you're doing fine We're all doing the best we can I could have been anywhere But I'm glad I'm here with you So cheer me up Yeah, you always do Yeah, you know, life can be tough. Roads are bumpy and the water's rough. Your skin starts to thicken up. You forget all those things you love. So we sit and drink for a while. Find some music on the FM dial. You make a joke trying to make me smile. And you do. Yeah, you always do. I could have been something better than whatever it is I am. You say I'm doing fine. We're all doing the best we can. Could have been anywhere, but I'm glad I'm here with you. Cause you cheer me up, yeah, you always do. Been having one of those days when nothing seems to go my way, but I got so much to celebrate because of you. Thank you. Peter Donovan, congratulations on the new record. Thank Check you. out the full band at the Tractor Tavern on July 3rd. We're going to take a quick intermission, take those quiz slips over to the merchant membership table, say hi, visit the bar. Restrooms are that way or at home. I hope you know where they are. Um, we got uh, a whole bunch more music and, uh, and more coming at you real quick. Thanks. Once we're brother.
inspiration from the page Now translated for the stage It don't matter what your age is All the rage is Right here at the Bushwick Book Club All right, readers and listeners It is quiz time Okay. Uh, so I'm going to start by making sure we're all on the same page. I'll read our slip question, make sure we all agree on the answer. Uh, what time was it in Nora's library? A, 11.57, B, 11.58, C, 11.59, D, 12. Anybody? Somebody always gets it wrong. Like, there's always at least one in here <laughs> that gets it wrong and didn't sign up for the email list. Uh, the answer is midnight. Okay. I'm going to draw three names. I'm going to make sure they've got the right answer. Uh, and then those people are going to come up here on stage and have a chance to play for uh, Bushwick Schwag. Right? First person to three gets first choice. Of a mug, <laughs> Bushwick mug. Unlike the last batch we ordered, these will not shatter when you put hot water in them. We <laughs> are growing as an organization. Uh, and I should mention, uh, this is a good time to mention uh, fundraising and development. Uh, our development director, Elise Newhall, is not here tonight, but uh, we thank you for your contributions. Um, we hope you see the results, okay? A pressed leather bookmark that says, I heart books and music, right? Or, a Bushwick t-shirt. All right, first person gets first choice. All right, if I call your name, come on up here. We'll be in order, one, two, three. And then we'll quiz. All right, okay. Make sure. All right, Alejandro Acosta. Ah. Very good. All right, let's write. Come to this one. Yeah, we got it, we got it. You get first, shorty. A. Okay. Jill Mayo. Yeah! I, I laughed. Uh, yeah. I mean, not because Jill is or isn't a funny person on her own, but this is the one person who grabbed me during intermission and said, pick me. And so, yeah. right. They knew in advance. Oh, this is rigged. Is there a conflict of interest if you're married to one of the performers? No. I'd marry all Especially the if you hired me at your wedding to do a quiz for your partnership? Okay. I don't know. All right. Ann Quigg. Yay! Uh-oh, we got two A's. What happens next? <laughs> okay. It's very simple. All of these quizzes are category A or category B. I'm going to say something and you tell me if it is the first category or the second category. First to three wins, we will play it out. Tonight's topic is fictional librarian or real life librarian. That's right. Uh-oh. Every name is uh, either a fictional librarian or a real-life librarian. <laughs> wow. All right. Uh, Hunter, we will start with you. Uh, Bob Baring. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Fictional librarian. That's incorrect. He's a noted UC Berkeley Law librarian. <laughs> Duh. All right, Jill. Hillary Robinson. Hillary Robinson. Hillary Robinson. Real librarian. Nope. Uh, <laughs> Hillary Robinson is a character on the Australian soap Neighbors. <laughs> All right. Yeah. I know. I Basil Atkinson. Oh. Is that real? Oh, yeah. Fictional? No. Uh, 
Basil Atkinson was keeper of manuscripts at the University of Cambridge from 1925 to 1960. We're back to you, Alejandro. All right. Anastasius Bibliothecarius. <laughs> Fictional? No. <laughs> Anastasius Bibliothecarius was the chief archivist of the Church of Rome and very briefly pope in the year 855. Oh, no. Romney Wordsworth. Real? No. <laughs> From an episode of The Twilight Zone called The Obsolete Man. All right. And Lotsey Patterson. Uh, real? That's correct! <laughs> Lotsey Patterson founded the American Indian Library Association. All right, Alejandro. Don Vincente. Real. No. no. It's a legendary bibliocriminal in a 19th century French newspaper hoax. Yes. So people thought he was real, but he was not. Uh, uh, Jill. Sarah Sugden. Sarah Sugden. Sugden. Fictional. Uh, that's correct. <laughs> From the British soap, Emmerdale. Yep. <laughs> and L. Quincy Mumford. Fictional? No. <laughs> 11th librarian of US Congress. There you go. Alejandro, Isidore Mudge. <laughs> Fictional. Real. Oh. You, you tried. Edited the guide to resource works. They don't know either. <laughs> okay. Jill, Betty Lou Perkins. Betty Lou Perkins? Oh, real. No. Oh, <laughs> Main character in uh, the 1992 film The Gun in Betty Lou's Handbag. Uh, also starring Meatloaf. Okay, Anne? Uh, Claire Augustus. Uh, fictional? That's correct. Yay! From the web comic Questionable Content. Oh, Andrew, we gotta get you on the board here. All right, Eliza Gleason. Real? That's correct! <laughs> Oh, they're cheering for you, yes. Uh, first African-American to receive a doctorate in library science. Yeah. Name everyone should know. Jill? Florence Davy Thompson. Florence Davy Thompson. Fictional? No, that's a founding librarian of the University of Manitoba. <laughs> and Miriam Radford. Fictional? That's correct! Uh, from Murder, She Wrote. All right. Uh, we're going to keep going, you two, and you get your first choice. You can visit the merch table uh, at the end of the show or whenever you like for prizes. Alejandro, Molly Dunlap. Fictional. Nope. Ah. He's real. Born in 1898. A very important person in African American studies. Uh, Jill. Carlton B. Jekyll. Carlton B. Jekyll. 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 Carlton B. Jekyll. Jekyll. Yeah. Sounds real. Uh, that's correct. Yeah. Wrote the National Plan for Public Library Service in 1948. Ooh. Sally Diamond. Diamond? Di with like like diamond, but with no D at the end. Diamond, Sally, diamond. Uh, real? No. <laughs> Main character in the 2004 film Chainsaw Sally. Uh, Jill, Doctor Abigail Chase. Doctor. I mean, a lot of these are doctors, but. Dr. Abigail Chase. Uh, doctor of Library Science. Dr. Abigail Chase. 
Fictional. That's correct. <laughs> Who can forget National Treasure? What a great film that was. All right, we're going to get you there. It's you the rest of the way. And I got a lot of these. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Andrea Crestadoro. Fictional. No, nope. oh. chief librarian of the Manchester Free Library from 1864 to 1879. Margaret Scoggin. Fictional. No, that's one of the first <laughs> librarians to consider young adult readers important for the New York Public Library. Peggy Court. <laughs> Fictional. That's correct. <laughs> from the Giant's House. One more to go. All right. Brooks Hatlin. Fictional. Mm, yeah, Sarshank Redemption. <laughs> All right. Alejandro, Jill, and thank you so much for playing. Visit the merch table. Thank you all for playing the Bushwick Quiz. All right. Coming up to the stage now while I switch over to this. Coming up to the stage now is uh, a Bushwick third timer, but this is his first time in front of an audience because we had to cancel the audience in January uh, due to what? He was on stage, but there's no audience. Oh, no uh, kidding! We did the show here in January just with no audience. So we're really so he went from from virtual to here. We're gonna switch spots, and you're gonna go over there. Yeah. Um, this is Jed. Chris Oligo. Everyone, we're really happy to have Jed and you in the room together. Make him welcome. I'm so glad you are here. Last time, thank you, me too. Uh, yeah, I've, I've been excited for this. Uh, the first time I did Bushwick, I uh, did the really you know, personal thing of sending an email of a, a video that I recorded in my home. <laughs> And that's what they broadcasted. And then the next time, we were really excited to do it upstairs in the big room. And then the day of, we canceled uh, the, the live audience. Um, so it was a bit of a like, a like a breakfast club thing. It was just a bunch of musicians in a well-lit, really huge, very empty. Uh, thinking about it now, they could have really dropped the lights because uh, it, <laughs> it, it was very noticeably empty. Uh, so now you're you're like the best crowd I've had at one of these officially. Thank you, and I'm glad you came because I was gonna start taking it personally uh, if there was no one here. I I had nothing to measure it against. I would have been like, man, my Bushwick draw sucks. Uh, <laughs> but you're there, I'm assured. Uh, and for a physical description, I am a bearded uh, Filipino gentleman of of uh yeah yeah. Is that for the beard or for the, the Pinoy? Oh, there you go. That's what. Uh, and I'm, I'm told, I'm, uh, I'm assured that I am of really adequate height. Uh, <laughs> and I have a lot of hair and I wear a lot of black. Um, yeah. And Midnight Library, what a, what a book, yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, I, did, I did really enjoy it. You can... Like, like other people kind of mentioned, you can see a bit of the, the mechanisms of how they do things, but I really loved Nora as a character and as a, a working musician who has a useless philosophy degree. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right? I, f I felt very um, attacked. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, by this book, and I'm also like a really recovering um, uh, regret user, a heavy regret user. I experience or are experimented for pretty heavily with regret uh, <laughs> to the point where uh, the challenge for this one was to, to write a song I haven't written yet, and uh, which is why I kind of rewrote my song this morning. Um, I settled on kind of exploring the physical way that regret shows up in your life, uh, the, the weight of it, the way it surrounds you and, and how it really slows you down. 
And uh, it doesn't have a name yet, so if you, if you think of one, um, well, I guess keep it to yourself. Uh, but uh, tell me at the end, at the very end. Could I get a little more guitar in the monitor? Perfect, thank you. Here goes. Some empty frame for someone else's dream. It's not some endless parade of the things you missed and the things you didn't take. stubborn breath an unrelenting gaze and an undecided step it's laughing on your knees until you get up on your feet just to do it all again when you fall flat in the street it's when you get there first cause you're not Well, 
is not what you think It's not some empty frame for someone else's dream Thank you. Jed Crisologo. You hear that? Jed, that's for you. And they're here. That's for you. Thank you. Yeah. Way better than last time. Yeah. All right. Check out Jed Crisologo and the Sun Killers. Coming up next, we have another first timer. The book club expands. It's been over 300 local musicians since we started in 2010. And it keeps growing. Uh, Kate Barrett is a lifelong songstress born and raised in Seattle. She writes, sings, plays multiple instruments, performs and produces original music. It's what she does. That's what the thing says. And she will soon be releasing an album she wrote, recorded, and produced in loving memory of and dedication to her most important musical mentor, rock and roll soul, Joseph Childress. Joseph by Kate Barrett. Coming soon. Make her welcome. this production here is called Quantum Fiction. I had a great time with this. I love writing songs. It's my favorite thing in the whole wide world to do. So I was thrilled when Bushwick Book Club invited me. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I need some things. So I'll just tell you about the process while I do this. This year I've been experimenting with this writing process called At the Speed of Creation. And like expect an album, you know? Um, it's going really well. I'm having a great time with it. And I decided that I wanted to use it. It's this, I'm recording and writing everything all with like my intuition in the moment as I go. And um, I'm using a Yamaha Motif synthesizer and my voice. And it is like, there are so many sounds in this keyboard. And as you've heard, and as I'm sure most of you have read, uh, this book has this multiverse energy, right? So I just was like, but I have all these sounds in this piano. So I decided to create a track um, in order to perform against today. And I hope you enjoy it. The song is called Quantum Fiction. Hit it. No inspiration, no motivation, just isolation, waiting at the station.
Kate Barrett. <laughs> Welcome to the Bushwick Book Club Seattle. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we were going to do this one quick, but that's fine. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll take care of that. You got this. <laughs> Kate Barrett. <laughs> and back to the Ballad of the White Tiger. I keep thinking back to that night. Me too. Celebrating. So happy and stupid and blind. And I had this plan for what was going to be next. Relax a little, travel, find new stories. This doesn't change that. Doesn't it? I mean, really, I know we're all being positive but I do not know how to go forward in this world right now. And doesn't the hospital, like, have uh, people, you know, to help you with that stuff? Yes, they do. You don't like them? Uh, yeah, I, I could help. I could be there and learn with you. And yeah? Of course. 
they come over and show me how to get myself to the toilet so I don't pee all over myself. Is that what you're volunteering for? Yeah, actually, <laughs> if you wanted. All the things that made me happy seem so tiny, so small now. Throughout this season, we've had performers on the bill who for one reason or another can't be with us in the moment. Uh, and so we've included some video contributions and we have another one right now from Matt Price. Hi, I'm Matt and I'm a recovering librarian. I guess what I'm saying is I spent a lot of years working in libraries and so maybe that's why I was drawn to this book. Plus, it's about somebody who doesn't fit in and who can't relate to that. Every day I wake up, every day I'm born again. Starting a new life right in the middle. Then I turn a corner and my life comes to an end. And I never even get to live a little And I've been a runaway all of my life I've been a runaway, oh Sometimes I have pretended I'm a leaf upon the wind I held somebody's hand but then I lost it if I could, I'd learn to love, I'd learn to love again But I fear that all my love has been exhausted I've been a runaway all of my life I've been a runaway, oh Undressed things with silver wings are right out Inside my vision Thunderous dreams and desperate schemes Demanding a decision do, 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 do. I heard my mother crying out She was crying out if this world would ever take me Mother dear, oh mother dear I wish that I could sleep But nothing in this world would ever wake me And I've been a runaway all of my life I've been a runaway
endless chain, it's an endless golden chain running through an endless hall of mirrors. And every time I up and die, I up and die again. Life gets a little bit dearer. And I've been a runaway all of my life. I've been watching because he's texting me during the show. So I'm very, very, <laughs> very happy to have that song from Matt and to have this chair from Jeff. Another hand for Jeff Larson wearing many of the hats he wears. And uh, the actual hat he's wearing tonight is, uh, uh, look, look, look out at the, show the people the hat. Put the hat in the, yeah. So style, right? It's not just what Jeff embodies every day of his waking life. It is, because uh, everything in education has to be done in acronym. It is Songwriting Through Youth Literature Education, which happens to be Bushwick Northwest's education program, where we visit schools or offer library programs, take books that students are reading anyway, and talk to them about inspiration and creativity and collaboration. Uh, and we're starting to book for the fall again. Um, some of the schools are letting us back in the classrooms, which is great. Um, and man, do we know how to share screen, uh, screen share at this point and, uh, and lock down our permissions on Zoom. So you can check out learningwithstyle.com uh, or come talk to us about it. Um, let's bring up Intisar. <laughs> or fill for some time. Okay, excellent. Very, very happy. This is Intasara's second Bushman performance. She made her debut earlier this season upstairs for original music inspired by Dune. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Which was Sandy. Uh, <laughs> Intasara is a Palestinian-American singer, songwriter, guitarist, most known for her emotive and unique melody lines, powerful vocal range, interesting chord progressions, and dramatic entrances. Hi, I want to switch this. I thought there was more time. Oh, thanks. Sorry, don't film this part. I don't have a long speech about what I wrote. So I'm just going to play it. Oh, wait. That's not good. I will, thank you. And that's what the book is really about. Yes! Yes! Time all together. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> I still want her. I feel like there's no guitar in the monitor. Can I have some more guitar in the monitor? Can I have a little less? Thank you. Okay, now I'm doing it.
drinking some water, going outside even when it's raining. One, two, cry, savor the static. These ups and downs can get. We'll be headlining a show at the High Dive in Fremont with Chattelist Natalie Hall and a full band on July 29th. Put it on your calendar one more time for Andy Sar. things you want to do? Like in my whole life? Yeah. Of course not. I'm 33. I have so many things. So many things that I never did because of Hannah. That's awful. Uh, it's just being in a relationship. Certain kind of a relationship? <sighs> Maybe. Mm. I mean, 10 years though? That was a long time. <laughs> that is a long time. <laughs> I remember when I introduced you. She was so excited. She thought you were so hot. <laughs> we were all just babies. Yeah. To answer your question, I wanted to go to Japan. That's the thing I wanted to do. We just never had the money when we were kids. There were three of us, and it's so far. And I figured when I had the means, I'd take Bachan. She'd be my little tour guide, and then we'd have this adventure, and she'd tell me all about her family all the stories, then Bachan died, and now I can't go, and Hannah stole it from me. It's fine. It's fine. I don't care. Ah, it doesn't bother me. Hmm. Kind of feels like you do care. 
What would what would you want to do before you die? Uh, easy. Road trip through the country and stay in cheap motels on the highway. I'll say goodbye to cram rooftop parties with coked up 20-somethings <laughs> I think they're still in college. <laughs> Live slower, I guess. I'll calm down. God, you sound so old. I think I was born old. <laughs> Me too. This right here, this is all going to feel like a little blip in the road when you're actually old. This whole thing, it's like, like when you have braces at 25. David! I like them, by the way. You don't remember. I do remember. You don't. Bye, David. <laughs> Later. I want to take a moment to thank some people because this doesn't happen without a lot of people showing up and saying yes. Evan is running front of house sound. Big hand for Evan. And, uh, Dave and Mo have been running sound for the live stream going out there. Wind, and, uh, wind, excuse me, wind is on. The camera feeds. I want to also give a season long thanks to Bruno, town hall's guy who knows the answer because he hides stuff and doesn't tell people where it is for a season's worth of uh, putting up with our questions. Show poster design from Michael Wallenfels. Seattle rep pieces directed by Elliot Hartman. <laughs> Bushwick production team of Jeff Larson, Melissa Montalto, A. Lisa Newhall, Wes Waddell. Your uh, house manager tonight town hall has been Candace. Hand for everybody. <laughs> We have one more song, but before we do that, I want to talk to you about next season. Yeah. All right? Because we made it this far, why not keep going into Lucky 13? And we're excited to announce that the 2022-2023 season, full spectrum, will all be titles related to color. Huh? All right, so what's going to happen is I'm going to tease a few of them here, and you're going to start thinking about what you're gonna say, what and ones we forgot, and be angry, and we'll let let us know. Let us know in the comments. That always goes well. Uh, we're really uh, we're really happy to just just truck along and continue the conversation and interaction of original music inspired by books, art inspiring art. Ideas are important. It's not on that one. Here it is. All right. So. Our first color-themed title that we are going to tell you about is Oscar Wilde's The Picture of Dorian Gray. Most likely slated for October and Halloween, to be confirmed. For people a little, who want a little more spring in their step, how about Lucy Maud Montgomery's Anne of Green Gables? Oh, that's happening. All right. And we will kick off in September with the Golden Compass, Philip Pullman. All right, we got one musician who's into it. All right, I'm, my inbox will start getting full here pretty soon, I'm sure. Um, we're really happy to keep trucking along. We're really happy to have you with us. Uh, it's nice to be able to do these. It's nice to be able to do it with you. Thank you for another season. Right? We did it. We did it. A lot of people didn't. And we did. And to help send us home, send us out into uh, the promised summer uh, amid atmospheric rivers is Kate Olson. K.O. Kate is a multi-instrumentalist and self-described weirdo. Lately, she has been taking an online intro to psychology class through Yale University, teaching herself to watercolor, baking strawberry rhubarb scones, and teaching jazz saxophone at Pacific Lutheran University. Well-rounded list there, Kate. Kate has a sixth lumbar vertebrae, bringing her grand total of bones to 207. A quick Google brings up the following, quote, having a sixth lumbar vertebrae in your spine is uncommon, but far from extraordinary. About 10% of the population has an extra bone in this region. End quote. Kate maintains that she is, in fact, 
extraordinary. <laughs> Despite the internet concluding otherwise, she's joined us for Dune, Station Eleven, Exhalation, How to Do Nothing, and the Bushwick and Jack Straw Cultural Center collaboration. Here to put a nice little bow on the 2021-2022 season, Woo! Kate Olson, KO. <laughs> Everybody. Hi. Hi, everybody. Hi. I want to I want to hear just a tiny bit more of myself in this monitor. I know I asked when we were sound checking. I asked to turn it down, but I've had a couple glasses of wine since then. So, yeah. uh, so before I forget, uh, for accessibility purposes, I would just like to get out of the way that I am a 39-year-old woman. I am five foot six inches tall. I weigh somewhere in the range of 130 pounds. I think. Um, it's been a long pandemic, y'all. Uh, I am wearing a dress and a black blazer and some black boots, and I have a little more gray in my heavy brown bangs than I used to. I am accompanied this evening by the fabulous Michael Ovchowruk. He's pretty tall. He's taller than me. He's wearing a striped shirt. He's pretty thin. I still have more tattoos than him, though. <laughs> Uh, he's wearing thin wire-framed glasses. Uh, so I actually suggested this book. I, I'm not the only person that suggested this book, but I did suggest it um, because I think it's wonderful. And I really wanted to read The Count of Monte Cristo, but apparently so did everyone else. So I didn't get on that show. So here I am, and I read it again. And... Um, It's really easy to compare yourself to others. And I think that Nora's journey in this book is about comparing herself to others. And I think that when I started rereading this book, I started comparing myself to Nora. And I said, well, at least Nora was good at sports. My parents kept me out of dancing because I was awkward. At least Nora has had, you know, good piano skills. I had to call Michael. <laughs> you know, her, her brother wanted her to be in his band, and uh, I remember my mom telling me, uh, when you sing, you kind of scoop into your notes, and it makes them sound a little out of tune, and that was when I was, like, 11, and I can tell you that I stopped singing for a long time after that. Uh, so, really, I think what this book about is about is about learning to live with yourself. But in that moment, I really identified with Nora, and I identified with her wanting to be anyone else. So, sorry everybody, it's a downer. <laughs> Take it away. Give me all my 
the dreams I live for you are gone to do long to find out I was so wrong. Flashing lights and closing doors, all my chances spread out on the floor. Take me anywhere but here Show me how to be anyone but me Thank you. Thank you to Bushwick and Wes and Jeff and everybody. Kate Olsen, Kale, joined by Michael Osharuk. And let's keep that applause going for everybody who was up here tonight. Bridget Quigg, Nick Draws, Kevin Hyde, Rob Arnold, Nottingham Wicks with Nick Allison, Peter Donovan, Jed Crisoligo, Kate Barrett, Matt Price, Intasar, and Kate Olson. From Seattle Rep, Reese Daly, Annalie Hamilton, Drew Highlands. All of it directed by Elliot Hartman. Big thanks to Nabra Nelson, Rep's Director of Arts Engagement. And I know I blew through it in the sort of quick, mushed mouth thank yous before, but getting to this point in the season, I want to give nods again to the Bushwick production team. All right, executive director and founder of the Bushwick Book Club Seattle and Bushwick Northwest, Jeff Larson. <laughs> Membership director, Melissa Montalto, over there at the table. <laughs> Taking photos tonight. Development director and all-around champion of all things art and public, Elisa Newhall. <laughs> I answered a few emails along the way too. Thank you for coming out. Thanks for being here with us and out there with us. We'll see you in September. Inspiration from the page. Now translated for the stage. It don't matter what your age is. All the rage is right here at the Bushwick Book Club.
Translate. 